Let's start with a prayer. Father, I pray that you'll bless my words and bless those who listen. I pray that it will be you who we hear through me speaking and our listening. Amen. The parable we've just heard leaves me with a sinking feeling. Mainly because for most of it, it sounds like one of those maths questions that you used to be given at school. You know the ones that go, if you pay three men ten hours for ten hours work, four men ten pounds for six hours, and three sons of the two men 50% of what you pay their fathers for two hours, then what's the name of the dog? Obviously, it doesn't ask for the name of the dog, but you feel that you've got a better chance of guessing that than you have of working out the actual answer. It's a question where it's easy to know what is being asked, but the hard part is getting your head round it. The same is true of this parable. It is easy to see that this parable is about the fact that God shows no favouritism with us when he deals with us. He treats us all in exactly the same way. The workers who start work at the beginning of the day receive exactly the same as those who start work at the end of the day. And it isn't dependent on the quality of the work either, just on the fact that they answered the call to work. The working of grace, where God does all the hard work for our benefit, is central to our Christian faith. And we rightly praise him for it every time we meet. I hope you've worked out that all the hymns and songs today have grace as their focus. The only thing we have to do for our salvation is to respond to the call of Jesus. That's easy to understand. So why is it so difficult for us to get our heads round it? Because when we think about it, it actually goes against how we work, against our sense of justice, against how the world operates, and how we operate in the world. And let's face it, that isn't unreasonable. When we read how the workers who started the day react when they find that they get paid the same as those who start later in the day, we are instinctively on their side. We will always be irritated by those who can do well in exams without having to put any work in, those who get lucky with money or a plum job, those who can stay slim but eat anything, and the list goes on. You can add your own. Equally, we will always be appreciative of people who put in time and effort, and we see their success in terms of the effort they put in. How often, when we describe someone's success, do we add, but they deserved it? Which is why our sympathy lies with those workers who have laboured all day, but have only been given the same as those who worked for an hour. We are outraged. But the really difficult bit is this. Jesus defends the owner. In fact, he gets more and more insistent about it, finally accusing them of being envious of the owner's generosity, which seems to be unfair. In Jesus' parables, God is always represented by the master or owner. So what gives here? Well, Jesus isn't talking about worth. He isn't trying to prove that the first workers aren't worth their work. The issue that Jesus is addressing is the problem of comparison. We can be very quick and inventive at deciding that we are worse off than others, or worse off now compared to other times. The Exodus passage shows this very well. The Israelites have been led by God out of slavery into the Promised Land, and instead of being thankful for their freedom, they complain about the lack of food. Having previously complained about how hard life was being slaves to the Egyptians, they're now complaining how hard life is, now they have to look after themselves. Remember when the main topic of discussion at work was how difficult the commute into work was? Now it's how difficult is it working from home all the time? We complain that the government isn't doing enough to combat Covid. Then we complain that they might be doing too much and sacrificing the economy. I'm not making a political statement here. The point is that comparison almost inevitably leads to discontent and grumbling. 
and we can find something of this in our own lives. And the problem is that we often let this attitude seep into our spiritual lives. We always have this sneaking suspicion that we aren't quite good enough for God, that the person in the next pew seems to be that bit more spiritual than us. But then again, at least we are more spiritual than the person in the pew further along. So there is a power to this passage that we really need to grasp hold of to help us. The key to us unlocking that power lies in understanding the role of the denarius, the wage that the owner gives to all workers. What is it? It isn't anything excessive. I'm not about to tell you that it gives us far greater riches than anyone could ever hope to own. A denarius in Jesus' day was what any reasonable worker would expect to receive from any reasonable employer for one day's work. So it wasn't a lottery win, but it did feed a family for a day, and it took away the tension of living for that day. And in Jesus' world, that would be true regardless of whether you worked for a full day or only an hour. Imagine receiving that denarius every day of your life. Suddenly, all fear and worry of life's basic provision is gone. Well, that is how God addressed the complaints of the Israelites. He gave them manna, which was enough food to live for each day, and he delivered that food every day. Too often, we look on salvation as though it's a ticket to get us into heaven. So the thing we must do is put it in a safe place so that we can find it on the day when it will be useful, by which we mean the day we die. Until then, we just get on with life as best we can. But this parable tells us that salvation is our daily bread, given as a gift to us right now, and given every single day of our lives. The manna, bread, that the Jews collected on a daily basis reminded them of God's continuing love for them that was renewed every day of their life. The Lord's Prayer, the prayer that came from Jesus' own lips, tells us to ask for that daily bread. That daily bread comforts us that we will be provided for every day. That is true spiritually as well as physically. So salvation removes the fear of what it means to live a life for God. Jesus ends the parable by saying that the first shall be last and the last first. On a superficial level, I suspect that we see this as some lovely expression that those who are unnoticed now will get their reward in heaven and that those who boast and brag their way to the top will be humbled. But when we think about it, that doesn't make any sense. Where does it place those who have come to prominence but have also been good? Where does it put the Mother Teresas of this world, the Billy Grahams, the Nelson Mandelas? And where does it put the plenty of awful people who remain completely unknown? Our problem is that we expect Jesus to act in the way that we do. We assume he is comparing us all to each other, but he isn't. And in that way, there is only one way that the first can be last and the last first. If we imagine it as a race, then we find that for the first to be last and the last first at the same time, then everyone has to finish in a dead heat. God's salvation is not relative to anything. It is the same for each one of us, rich or poor, male or female, privileged or unprivileged. I could go on, but you get my point. This is why Jesus can describe the owner as generous, because accepting everyone exactly as they are is true generosity. And when we accept that, it takes away the fear of thinking we aren't good enough, or not as good as someone else. It takes away the self-righteousness of thinking that we are better than others. When we see salvation as our daily bread, we can relax because then we see that all our basic needs have been given to us already and we can now fully enjoy the life that God wants us to live.
Amen.